Hey, g'day, it's Prezzo here back in the shop and welcome to part two of the Sexy Lixi Art Deco inspired digital clock. In the last episode I was preparing to build these boards which drive the edge lit displays uh, which will eventually go into the digital clock. I've got one here running a sketch called Demo Reel and this is in the Fast LED library and it just simply shows you some of the display parameters you can get with these LEDs. Uh, it looks quite pretty and it uses some sort of uh, devil magic which I don't understand to address individual LEDs and uh, cycle through the colors and it, it does all sorts of effects. I am using this at the moment to test the boards as I populate them with the LEDs and doing it this way I find that you can isolate an individual LED that's got a problem and fix it before you go forward. Now I did have a go at uh, reflow soldering one of these boards and uh, it's fair to say it was a complete and utter failure. Now I did everything that I thought was correct. I downloaded the profile chart which shows the temperatures at which you should hold the boards to ensure that the solder reflows correctly and you don't uh, burn up the board or stress the joints or anything like that. I used a solder template which you can see here and uh, I used the solder paste. Uh, this just flips up so you can put the circuit board in there and uh, I used my old MasterCard <laughs> to <laughs> spread the solder paste and uh, that worked okay uh, I put it in two separate ovens, uh, one of which was a toaster oven and I had a digital thermometer in that so I could monitor the temperature. That one was set to 150 degrees centigrade. I also had my powder coat oven which has a PID controller so I know that that one can be set to an accurate temperature as well. I had that one set to 225 degrees centigrade and I timed the processing in each individual oven and I swapped them over quickly and looking through the door of the oven I could see that the solder was in fact reflowing but when I took it out it looked a bit grainy, it didn't look quite right and uh, that particular board has not worked at all. None of the LEDs light up so I suspect that uh, somehow I cooked the LEDs and uh, that board is now scrap. However I thought about it and I figured that you know what these things happen. Uh, don't lose your temper and most importantly keep a sense of proportion. But I've decided to move forward and scrap that technique altogether and now I'm hand soldering all of these joints. Now there are 20 LEDs on each board, there are 4 individual joints for each LED and I need 12 boards. But I've found a technique now that is giving me more consistent results. So let's have a look at that. So the, uh, the revised technique I'm using now is I'm cleaning the board lightly with some steel wool. This is probably totally unnecessary, but um, I'm just try, trying to make sure that I get good joints because the first couple of boards I did, I had a few failures and since I've been doing this technique, it's working for me. Next thing I'm doing is I'm fitting a, a three pin uh, header to this end of the board, which is the, the input side. And I'm fitting a single electrolytic capacitor. Um, now you don't need these on every single board but just in order to test it, I, I am. I can remove them later or they can stay there, it doesn't matter. I'm also using a, a resin flux now and uh, I'm finding that that's working much better for me. So I'll fit these header pins and the capacitor and then we'll have a look at fitting the uh, LEDs. Okay, so the, uh, the next thing I'm doing is just painting this whole board with resin flux and you can see by the, the white arrow lines on this board that you need to start populating the board at this end and work your way along that zigzag line and that way you can test individual LEDs as you go. So with these um, LEDs 
there's a little white triangle in one corner and that needs to line up with the top left sorry with the top right pad and just to keep everything in place as I'm soldering I've got a little um, gravity clamp here and just take a little bit of care to make sure that you got each individual LED pad lined up with the board underneath and then it's just a matter of trying to get some solder on each one of those pads. Now I'm old enough to remember what it was like doing electronics back in the 1970s and this is when you had components with wires on them like fencing wire and uh, you didn't need good eyesight and steady hands to be able to do it well but I'm finding this is quite difficult for me because um, I'm not getting any younger and I'm finding it really difficult to keep my hands steady while I form these solar joints. When I first started this I was finding it really hard to get properly wetted joints. Um, as it's turned out they don't look pretty but like, like I say I'm getting more consistent results now. Okay, so that's those four done, and what I do then is plug that into the uh, breadboard, check it, and if it's good, I just keep going like that. So let's just check that one. So I'll take this board out, which I already know is good, and I just plug those three header pins in, and okay, so you can see there that. There's something dodgy with that. It's probably the header pin. So let me go back and do that again. Okay, that's better. So that's the process I'm using. So I'm just going to go through and add individual LEDs. I just put it into the board, the breadboard, check it, and work my way through like that. Now the last three boards I've done, I've got all the way through with no errors. And by the way, you just got to be a little bit careful when you've got a single LED because this sketch does go through a routine when it, uh, it cascades the LEDs one after the other. And it might look like it's dead, but as you can see now, it's fine. So let's do another one. All right, here's the next one. Cool. And like I say, just keep doing that. Now, there have been several people in the comments in the previous video that's given me lots of advice about how to do this uh, reflow soldering process. And uh, look, I appreciate that and uh, a lot of the techniques seem valid. But at the end of the day, I've just fallen back to a process that um, I know is working. And I don't really have a lot of these LEDs spare, so I didn't want to sort of kill another board and you know end up having to reorder all these parts. So I'm going to keep going with this technique, it's working for me. I'm not going to bore you by doing an entire board. I'll show you when I've got six done and then we're going to try and assemble a six digit Lixi unit and drive it uh, with the microcontroller. And hopefully we get a working clock. I'll just give you a quick update. There are nine complete error free boards here and uh, I've got two which have faults. And you can see here that if I flex this board, I can get these LEDs to light up. So somewhere in amongst all those joints, there's a couple of dodgy joints or one dodgy joint. So I'm going to have to clean these really thoroughly and go back over and resolder all the joints till I can track down the fault. Uh, you would think that it'd be fairly easy to find, but it's not because you can see all these LEDs are out and then I've got these ones on and yet they're not receiving data so there's something funny going on there and I so far I've not been able to work out how you can track that down but I do know that all the LEDs are good because when I flex the board you can see they all start to behave normally so that one has a fault that was one of the early ones that I did this one also has a fault so same deal if you if you flex that you can get them to light up so those two um, I'll clean them with isopropyl alcohol and uh, get rid of all the old resin flux and all the residue of the solder paste. Those uh, particular boards were ones that I did with the, the paste solder and I was squeezing it onto the pads and then reflying it just with the soldering iron. And I think that was a big mistake. 
let's just finish off the last board, fix those, and then we can start daisy chaining these together and see if we can get six running as a clock module. So the, the idea is that um, you can just simply put the boards side by side and then bridge these three pads uh, between each set of boards and that allows you to create two, four, six or however many digits you want in a finished clock. Now that I have all 12 of these boards working and tested it's time to start assembling these into this frame. The screws that I bought to do this were 2.5mm diameter stainless steel with a pan head and they fit through four holes to locate and hold each of the Lixi circuit boards in place. But when I had a look at it, I didn't like the look of these stainless steel screws against the black acrylic. Uh, so what I did instead was I purchased some um, black countersunk head screws and they fit into the countersinks that I've already drilled in the plastic part. I think these are going to look a lot less obtrusive and uh, they're going to blend into that uh, frame quite nicely. And with the digits lit up, you're not going to see these at all. What I've decided to do uh, as far as connection for these Lixi boards is that I've got a three pin header at either end and uh, one end will go to the microcontroller and then the boards are simply daisy chained together. So what I'll need is a three pin plug uh, at either end of a, a three strand wire and these are going to be obviously very short but it's going to allow me to just simply plug and play with these boards and if there's a fault you can take one out without having to do a lot of desoldering and so on. So what I'm going to need to connect these boards together is a double-ended version of this. Now I did have some of the crimp-on plugs or the crimp-on sockets and I've got some of the plastic shrouds but these were four pins and I need three. I also don't have the appropriate crimping tool uh, so I've had to order one of those we're just going to have to wait for that to come in. But in the meantime, let's get these boards assembled and ready to go. So what I'm going to do is to fit one of these uh, masks. I think it goes that way. And we're going to put a board on. I think it goes that way. And eventually, this is all going to have to come apart again so that I can fit the, the actual digit panes in place. But what I want to do first is to make sure that the... Uh, microcontroller is talking to these displays properly and uh, I want to be sure that it's connecting to the Wi-Fi and if I'm happy with all of that we'll go ahead and reinstall the panes because with those they've got to be kept super clean and I don't want to be sort of sitting around for a couple of weeks uh, doing a lot of testing with those in place. So when we're sure that everything's kosher we're going to dismantle, put all the digit panes in place and then we should be able to insert this into the finished timber frame. So just for the time being, uh, we're going to get all six of these boards in place and test it. So on this side, you should be able to see all of the LEDs through the little uh, rectangular slots. Okay, so there's one of them done. As you can see, the, the black countersunk head screws sort of just disappear into that black frame. So that's great. That's how I want it. And uh, one of these sockets will connect to this end. And that's going to go through to the uh, microcontroller. Okay, get the rest of the boards on here and I'll show you when I'm done. Alrighty, so there's all six done now. If you're wondering about these odd spaces between the pairs, uh, this is to just give us some space between the hours, minutes, seconds. And I'm hoping to get a single RGB LED uh, lined up with this pair of slots here where the colon markers will go. Got absolutely no idea how I'm going to do that, how I'm going to do it electronically anyway. But um, I've got just enough room to get it in there without going over the 400 millimeter length that my laser uh, is capable of cutting. So the things I needed to buy to move forward with this project and what actually caused the delay was getting hold of a good pair of crimping pliers 
and also a kit which contains the, the female pins that I needed and it also has the, the three-way plastic cases for those uh, connectors. All the other stuff, I'll put that aside, it's going to be useful at a later stage. These um, kits you can get on eBay and I'll put the link in the description below if you're interested. Uh, they're dirt cheap and uh, there was no problem getting uh, a larger kit than I needed. They will come in handy at a later stage. These uh, crimping pliers though, I got these uh, from a local Australian supplier mainly because I couldn't be bothered waiting a month to get one out of China. These are actually made in China but they're quite well made. Uh, this set has a ratchet which means that as you close this on the connector it'll grip it while you struggle with the wire and get it through the connector and uh, it uh, crimps both the strain relief and the wire termination at the same time and it's got a little feature in here which allows you to position the, the pin accurately while you push the wire through. There are cheaper ones available but they don't have those features and uh, for what I paid I thought this was good value. Now I'm not going to go into the actual process of this step by step because um, I basically just watched what other people were doing on YouTube and I learned that way. The thing is uh, I ruined about the first 10 uh, attempts that I made at this and uh, you probably will too. Uh, but once I got into a rhythm and a workflow uh, I was able to get reliable connectors out of it each time. Let's just look now at the other tools that I had on hand uh, which I've been using to make these connectors. Okay, basic tools that you probably going to have on hand are a pair of wire strippers. I also use a pair of needle nose pliers and a good pair of wire cutters. The other thing that I used, uh, which I found came quite in handy, was a dental pick. And I use this to extract the pins from the plastic cases if anything goes wrong. So um, having something like that, a small pointed tool or a very fine screwdriver is uh, useful. The other thing that you might need is a multi-tester. Um, this is just so I can test continuity on these connectors as I make them. It's probably going to be frustrating if you fully assemble a clock and then realize that you've got a bad connection on one of those pins. The workflow I've been using so far is to have six of these pins already cut off and ready. Uh, so you need three at each end of a connector cable. So there's my pins all ready to go. And the other thing I do is just to strip the insulation off these wires and have them also ready to go. I should take off a little bit more insulation than I need. Right, so I've exposed about four to five millimeters there, which is too much, but it's easier to take more than you need and clip it back rather than trying to work really close to the end of the wire. And the other thing I do here is just to twist that, try and bind that copper together as much as you can and I've just been clipping these off to around about two to three millimeters long okay the next thing I need to do here is to close this crimping tool until the jaws are just starting to interlock just enough so that when you push the pin through it's sort of trapped there and it's less likely to fall out. Now, like I said, if you're doing this for the first time, you'll probably struggle with working out which way around you put the pin uh, and how far you need to extend that through the jaws and so on. This particular tool has like a little um, ledge on the inside of the jaws that traps the wings when you push it through and the pin projects from the other side of the jaws the correct distance and it enables you to just see the copper wire protruding through uh, when you do the crimp. Now to do the next bit I'm actually wearing a magnifying lens so I can see what I'm doing more easily. And it's just a matter of poking the wire through there. And then you look on the other side and you've got to just see the copper starting to push through past the edge of the jaw and then just crimp that as far as it will go and let me see if I can zoom right in on that so the thing that you should notice here is that the insulation wait a minute there, there it is 
So the insulation is just short of this section of the crimp here and the little wings that were originally open have now gripped and created the strain relief on the insulation itself. So there's one there that I reckon is okay and uh, like I say I've been able to get fairly consistent results with that now. I'm finding I can make a complete double-ended connector in around about two to three minutes. When I first started it was nearly ten times that long. So probably the only other thing you need to see with this is that when you push this pin through into its plastic housing it'll actually go in, it only goes one way by the way uh, and you'll quickly work out which way that is but when you push it in it'll sort of go in that far and then sometimes it jams and the reason for that is that this little strain relief here isn't fully formed. I just get my needle nose pliers and I just give that a bit of a squish, not much and then I've been finding that that goes in quite well. So, there we go. So it sort of goes in and then you'll feel it click once and then it clicks a second time. And when you pull it back it should grip. So that's that and it's just rinse and repeat and you do all of them the same way. Okay, so I'm going to get all of these made and then we're going to go up and we're going to connect this up to the ESP8266 and see if everything's kosher. These are the two microcontrollers I've been using so far on this project. The Arduino Uno is uh, well known now and I use this one for doing the testing of the boards as I was building them. The advantage with this is that it does have uh, a receptacle for an external power supply it also has a built-in USB port so you can connect it directly to your computer. Now, the pin layout is fairly easy to understand and it uh, has a readily available number of sketches and libraries uh, using the Arduino IDE. However, it does have some disadvantages. The main one being that to run a clock with this is not quite as straightforward as you might think. There are ways of doing it, but um, they're not necessarily accurate and they do rely on some external components. So let's just put that one to one side. The ESP8266 that I bought is called a Node NCU and apparently there are several variations of that and I'll put the exact name of the one that I bought up on the screen. This is a little Wi-Fi antenna that's built into the board. It does have a USB port built in and a reset button. However, it doesn't have a port for an external power supply. There is a ground pin and there's also a voltage in pin uh, which you can use to feed in 5 volts, which is what the Litsis need to run at. And it does have a built-in regulator as well. Let's take a look at how we're going to program this with the Arduino IDE. Luckily, Con and Nishijima actually already created a sketch and a library specifically for running the Litsis and specifically for using this as a clock. So let's take a look at that now. Just to talk you through setting up the Arduino IDE to talk to your ESP8266, there's just a few, what I now know, are fairly simple things you need to do. But at the time, it took quite a lot of research and planning to get this to work. The first step is you open your Arduino software, you go to Preferences, and if you look down here under Additional Board Manager URLs, you need to copy and paste this particular URL from the internet. Now, I was able to research and find this fairly easily, but I'll put this in the description on the video below, and uh, that way you can copy and paste that straight in there, and that will allow you to download the correct board manager. Now, I've already done that, so let's have a look under Tools. First thing you will need to do is go to Boards Manager, and right down the bottom here, you can see that I've already installed the ESP8266 board software. Then you go to Tools and down here under Board you can see that here's all my ESP8266 modules and this is the particular variation that I'm using. So once you select that, uh, from then on you'll be able to upload code to your correct ESP8266 board. Uh, you do the normal thing of selecting the port, in my case port is COM6 and I believe you can change your upload speed and your CPU frequency and so on but I just left those as defaults. 
And from that point on, you would think that it would be fairly straightforward. However, there was also an additional board driver that I had to be able to download and install. Now this information wasn't readily available. I think I looked at a couple of YouTube videos before I worked out that this was an additional step that you had to do for the particular board that I had. Once I did that though, everything seemed to work fine and I could see that code was uploading to the board fairly easily. So that's pretty much about it. Um, if you're used to using Arduino, then you'll get the hang of this very quickly. What you're looking at here is the sketch that Connor has made available on his GitHub page. I'll put the link in the description below if you want to uh, download a copy of this for yourself. And uh, it runs pretty much straight out of the box. However, there are a few simple things you need to change to get it to work with your particular setup. Down here you can see a place where you can include your Wi-Fi SSID, just there. And directly below that you can include your password. Uh, you can change it from 12 hour to 24 hour time by changing this from true to false, but I'm just going to leave it at true. And uh, in here you can change from six digits to four digits by changing this, uh, this call out here. Now, Funnily enough, I couldn't get it to display six digits when I changed this to true and on the sketch that I'm using now I changed it back to false and it seems to work. The other thing you need to change here is, uh, well you don't have to, but you can change the color of your Lixi displays. Uh, by default it's set at uh, cyan uh, and these are RGB values. So we've got red at zero, uh, green at 255 and blue at 255. On my clock, I want this to look more like the Nixie orange color. So I changed that to 255 for red, 102 for green, and zero for blue. But like I say, you can make it whatever you want. The time offset in my case is plus 10, and that's uh, Queensland time in Australia. And you look that up on the web and find out what your time offset is for a UTC clock. And that's pretty much it. That, uh, that more or less works straight out of the box. Uh, one other thing that you might want to change is down here where it says Licks Right. And in this particular section of the sketch, it says this sets all the lights to yellow while we're connecting to Wi-Fi. And by default, when you get the sketch, it'll just have four eights there. Now I made it eight 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 eight, so that would show all of the Lixi panels lit up with a number eight while it's waiting to connect to Wi-Fi. Same down here, by default, it starts off with just four nines. If you add an extra two, all your Lixie displays will light up with nines and it changes to green when you know it's connected to your Wi-Fi. Okay, and that's pretty much it. That's more or less works um, first time round for me. What I wanted to be able to do though, was I wanted to be able to have the colons lit up with an RGB LED between the hours, minutes and seconds. Now I found a sketch that would do that and it's just simply called Blink and uh, this is in the Fast LED library which also is fairly easy to get and it just has a very simple bit of code down here which uh, turns a uh, programmable RGB LED on and off for on half a second, off half a second. and Naively, I thought that all I would have to do is to merge this particular sketch with the NTP clock sketch. Now this just demonstrates how little I know about coding. So I went ahead and I just copied all of this code here, a whole lot, and I just pasted it directly on top of the NTP clock code. And as you pretty much expect, it was complete failure, nothing happened. Then I decided to go away and do a bit of reading, and I found out that you can't just copy and paste. You've got to make sure that individual sections of the code, uh, like the this opening section here where you're defining libraries and pins and whatnot, you just copy those sections there and put them into the other code. Then in the setup down here, you only copy the lines you're interested in, which in my case was just that one. And in the loop section, you only copy just the commands that you want from this and put them into the other code. Now, I 
thought I was getting somewhere, but once again this completely failed because I had forgotten about using a semicolon separator at the end of a few lines. And after nearly six hours of frustration, I finally realized that I was missing a single semicolon. Once I put that in, it started to work for me. So on my modified uh, version of the code, you can see here that I've got my Wi-Fi name and my password. Yes, they're not, not my real Wi-Fi name or password, but you get the idea. I've changed the RGB color. You can see here from 255, uh, 255, 255 to just full red and 102 of green to give me that orange glow. And I put my time offset at plus 10, which is where I live. Now, you'll also see that I've included a couple of extra libraries. So I've included the fast LED library up here, and that's to get my colon LED to light up. I've included a definition of an extra pin. So in this case, uh, pin two is what I'm running for my colon LEDs. The original pin for the clock software is pin five. Down in the setup section here, I've got, um, here, yeah, this line of code is what runs my LEDs for the columns. So uh, pretty straightforward, just um, adding the LEDs uh, data pin here and the number of LEDs that I'm using, which is going to be two. Okay, uh, what else? Down here in the void loop, I've included these two lines of code here. And that's what actually runs my two RGB LEDs. And so far, that seems to be working. I've got a, got a bit of a glitch in it, which I'll show you in a minute, but I'm pretty sure I can resolve that. I wish I knew more about coding. Okay, in order to get the RGB LEDs uh, positioned so they can light up these colon panes, and these are extras that I've made up for my clock, and I know that they were in Connor's original design. But what I've decided to do is to cut off two strips of this material. This is called Vero board. Anybody who's doing electronics back in the 70s and 80s will remember this stuff. I think it's still available today. But it just has perforated copper strips attached to one side of an insulated board. And if I cut off two copper strips, it's just wide enough to fit between the Lixie boards and the LEDs themselves can uh, solder down to those copper tracks. So what I've come up with is this little gadget here. So this is just the same two strip uh, piece of Vero board. The RGB LED is soldered down to one end and I've um, cut through the copper tracks directly underneath the LED and also adjacent to the, the last two connectors there. And that separates all four conductors on the LED. I've got three Ys, once again, the red is the data signal, uh, black and blue are for supply voltage and those wires come through the board and are soldered on top. So this, when connected to the microcontroller, should give me control over the colour of the columns and I can also make them blink on and off. Okay, well here we are with this thing assembled or at least as assembled as I can make it at this stage. I only have four of the digit panes on one of the Lixie modules and I've only got one of these little colon markers just sitting in its uh, slot at this stage and the little um, single LED is sitting underneath there you can see that lining up correctly there now. When this all goes into the clock frame uh, it, everything's going to be aligned correctly and held correctly that's not a problem. The microcontroller is sitting on a breadboard at this stage but later on that's all going to be hardwired and it's going to sit underneath the clock case uh, I'll break out the reset button and the 9 volt, or at least sorry, the, the 5 volt power connector into the back of the clock as well. So at the moment this is just running off 5 volts, it's not connected to the computer. And uh, I'll just show you, uh, there's, there's still a glitch in the code somewhere. Every now and then you'll see some of these uh, LEDs blink just very, very briefly. Um, I believe that's something to do with the way I've done the code and I'm hoping I can resolve that. It's just a bit annoying at this stage. Uh, I'll just show you what happens if you reset the controller. So it goes yellow, searching for the Wi-Fi signal. OK, 
a green when it finds a signal and then it should boot up. Now it doesn't always and once again I don't know why that is. You sometimes have to reset two or three times before you get a connection. There it goes. You'll also notice that I've got all of the inactive LEDs lit up uh, in a very low power blue and this is designed to just give the digit panes that sort of blue haze that you see with a with a, the old-fashioned Nixie tube and you can turn that off or on it's up to you you can also reduce the amount of blue you make it whatever color you want really at the moment I've got it turned on I think it looks cool um, we'll see how it looks when it goes into the finished clock frame oh and before I finish up I'm just going to turn the lights out to give you some idea of what this looks like in semi-darkness Okay, well there it is. It's still sort of semi-light outside. I've got a bit of daylight coming in, but um, it'll give you a, a different idea about what it's going to look like when it's completely done. Um, I think that it's going to look different also when it's got the case around it and the, the back of the clock blocked off. But, um, I don't know, it's showing promise. So it's looking cool and um, I think it's worth proceeding with it. Okay, so um, I'll finish up this video here now as it's gotten quite long. Um, I'm sorry, but it uh, got a bit boring. There's uh, not much I could show you with the coding and also the, the wiring and fixing the circuit boards and so on. That's just taken a long time. In the, the next video, we'll look at the woodworking, making the timber case, doing the veneering. We also have to do the metalwork uh, for the trim around the bezel. There's a lot of painting and finishing and all that sort of stuff. So it's going to get more exciting, I promise. But uh, for now, thanks for watching.